Now speakers from the opium of the masses will go to the professor and chair of the Committee on Neurobiology of Addictive Disorders at the Scripps Research Institute, George Koob. Well, the, the last speaker actually ended on an interesting note, which is opium. And if, if there is a drug that actually is the most harmless of all the drugs of abuse, it's actually opium. But you'll have to read my book to, uh, to understand that. And uh, one of my, uh, certainly, contributions a personal life to flourishing is narcissism. So I'm starting off with a, a picture of my book, all right? Now, there's a couple of points about this uh, book that are important, uh, th this particular slide, which is this is actually a Picasso, and how academic press managed to get us the copyright ability to show this, I don't know. But this lady is drinking a drink that contains alcohol, and uh, it, it's called absinthe, and, it, and it's at the turn of the 18th century to the 19th century, and it's um, a drink that contains a very high amounts of alcohol, but also a, a convulsant a stimulant drug called Thujone. So this lady was taking a stimulant and a sedative hypnotic at the same time. And she doesn't look very happy. And, and, and that's uh, kind of the next point, uh, close to the next point I want to make. So this is, um, I told the Board of Trustees at the Scripps Research Institute a week ago that this is my life's work, all right? And, and basically, what this illustrates is the neural circuitry of, of hedonism, if you will, and anti-hedonism, or what I call anti-reward. So the structures here outlined are, are focused and color-coded for the different components of the addiction cycle that you're probably all familiar with if, if you want to pick your drugs, psychostimulants, alcohol, opiates, whatever. And you just heard about habits, and you heard about um, you know, William James's focus on habits, and habits are a key part of the positive reinforcing effects of drugs, and, and they, uh, those positive reinforcing effects or pleasurable effects of drugs actually drive into the habit circuitry very heavily, as you can see over there in the blue. But one of the things that, that my work is focused on and I'm particularly interested in is the fact that once that positive reward system is engaged, there is a payback time. The, there's no free ride in the brain, hedonic circuits. And so the negative affect component there is actually the negative emotional state that follows when you have overindulged in drugs of abuse. So obviously this isn't anything that the previous speakers have talked about, but if you want to really disturb the brain's hedonic systems, you take a drug of abuse or you binge on cocaine for the weekend or you overdo your alcohol tonight at dinner. And the next day there is going to be an after effect. And that after effect, it, you could logically say, well, that after effect is probably just due to the loss of the, of the neurotransmitters that make you feel good. But my contribution, if there is one, has been to argue that there is another component to this, which is uh, an anti-reward component that is driven by systems in the brain put there to limit reward. And that has some philosophical implication. The preoccupation anticipation bit is all the craving components, all the executive function, all the decision making that then ultimately becomes compromised in addiction and of course uh, also has a terrific impact on how you interpret uh, philosophically the capability of an individual to get out of the addiction cycle once they've gotten into it. So one of our arguments has been um, building on work by Richard Solomon at the University of Pennsylvania many years ago which is that there's an opponent process which I just described to you. So when you take a drug, it makes you feel really good. And that's great. There's nothing particularly wrong with that if it's one glass of wine or maybe two glasses of wine, depending on how big you are. But, the, but there's a payback. And if you don't believe me, even after two glasses of wine tonight, you will wake up in the middle of the night, I can guarantee you, at 3 in the morning with a dry throat and have to go to the bathroom, and you're not going to feel so hot, right? Well, maybe for some of you it's going to take three glasses of wine, okay? But trust me, you'll have an opponent process. Well, that's not a big deal, but if you're doing, uh, you know, several grams a day of, of morphine, um, that opponent process the next day is so excruciating that it produces a syndrome very similar to what some of you saw if you saw the movie um, Train Spotting, where the person is in basically in motivational agony. So. Our argument has been that the opponent process doesn't really, I mean, the argument that Solomon made was this gets bigger and bigger over time, this, this negative after effect. But our argument is 
that it may not get bigger and bigger over time so much as that it keeps driving itself lower behind, below a set point. So that ultimately a drug addict, who, someone who is hooked on drugs, is trying to claw their way back to a normal motivational state. And they never quite get there. And in the process, and this is the key point, in the process of trying to get back to this normal hedonic state, they're making that hedonic state worse. Okay? And so you're digging yourself into a hole. That's called allostasis. And, um, and it, it, in a sense, it, it represents a form of allostasis in our view, but an allostasis in the reward system. Allostasis was a concept developed in physiology to argue that we don't always adjust our bodies in a homeostatic way. We adjust our bodies to function. And sometimes that set point moves out of the normal range. And two good examples of that in society today would be high blood pressure, which is rampant. Um, and also obesity, all right? Both of those are allostatic changes where the organism functions, but they're defending a, a set point that ultimately can become pathological and end up with metabolic dis disease or something of that nature. So if you get to this point, um, and, and why are we built this way? And what is the philosophical implications of this? So, you know, I came up with hedonic Calvinism not Calvinistic hedonism, but Cal hedonic Calvinism, which obviously is an oxymoron, because Calvin was a philosopher who believed in an ascetic life on Earth to, to translate to a, a future life uh, in, in the afterlife. But my argument is that the brain hedonic system is a limited resource. And as you heard from the other speakers, how you use that resource determines whether you flourish or don't flourish. Um, such a resource could be expended rapidly in a binge of drug taking, and, and such a depletion of resources could set up a vulnerability for entrancing, entrance into the spiraling dysregulation of the addiction cycle. And so, in my view, a hedonic Calvinistic approach would be to restrict the use of the reward system within a homeostatic boundary. And I think you heard some of that from some of the other speakers of how socially, philosophically, intellectually, one can do that. Um, my view would be that that if you push the system to the point that there is an after effect, then you are in the zone where the brain is going to have to adjust to that. And the way I explain it to myself is, if you're on the savanna in Africa and you're a hyena and you come across roadkill from some, you know, lion that pack, that the lioness pack that just left some leftovers, and you sit there and eat to the point that you cannot move, you're going to be the next meal for the next lion pack that comes down the road. And, you know, have you ever wondered why we don't copulate all the time? Why don't we copulate all the time? Um, what limits that pleasure? So I think even with natural rewards and natural reward systems, there are systems built in our brains to limit the pleasurable uh, sensations that reverberate through these circuits. And uh, the one that we've been studying is a corticotropin releasing factor. It's a peptide that controls uh, uh, bodily responses to stressors. But there are many other neurotransmitters involved in a part of the brain in your temporal lobe called the amygdala that was part of one of my slides there that probably have uh, equally important or possibly equally important functions in re-regulating our hedonic state. And so that's what I study. Um, I started working on stress in my graduate work, and I finished working on stress. <laughs> I'm finishing working on stress in my career, but it all come around to trying to understand how our brain actually processes good feeling, good, good stimuli, and pleasurable stimuli um, in, in everyday life. And then finally, I just want to mention that can you get this way through process addictions? Is, is this limited only to... Uh, addictions that involve drugs, and a process addiction is defined by the American Society of Addiction Medicine as an addiction, with a non-drug addiction. So gambling would be an example of that. And yes, I think the brain can engage these same circuits through excesses in uh, engaging stimuli that form pleasure uh, and activate these systems in a, in a non-drug way. Thank you. <laughs>